Hey, everyone who's tuning in, we're just going to give folks a few minutes to um, join the webinar and then we'll get started. All right, how does everyone feel about getting started now? Sounds good to me. Sounds good. Okay. Um, so welcome everyone to RebPsych 2020, uh, Decolonizing Mental Health. Uh, we're so glad that you can be here with us tonight. Uh, my name is Niantara Anderson and I'm here with Marco Ramos. We are both psychiatry residents at Yale and we're on the um, organizing committee for RebPsych. We want to begin tonight's exciting workshop with an acknowledgement that indigenous peoples and nations, including the Mohegan, the Mashantucket Pequot, the Eastern Pequot, the Shakatcock, and the Golden Hill Pog Pogacet, the Niantic, and the Quinnipiac, and other Algonquin speaking peoples um, have stewarded through generations the lands and waterways of what is now the state of Connecticut. Um, we honor and respect this enduring relationship that exists between these peoples and nations and this land. So this conference aims to explore what decolonizing mental health means today. And we kicked off the series with a wonderful keynote lecture last week on rethinking addiction from Professor Angela Garcia. And um, we're going to drop a recording of that keynote into the chat. Tonight, we are delighted to introduce a workshop, and this is our, the first of our sort of evening series, um, and it's entitled Critical Mental Health and Liberation Psychiatry, Decolonized Community-Based Approaches to the Mental Health Industrial Complex. Our wonderful presenters that we have today are Stephanie Lynn Kaufman Timkulu and Sochi Cartland. Stephanie is a gra graduate of Brown University and the founder and executive director of Project Let's. It's a national grassroots organization led by and for folks with lived experience of mental illness, madness, disability, trauma, and neurodivergence. Their work specializes in building peer support collectives in higher education and non-carceral community mental health care structures. They have built and led hundreds of workshops across various sectors for students, professionals, and healthcare practitioners, and also consulted on mental health policies for several universities. Stephanie comes to this work with lived experience of disability, neurodivergence, and psychiatric incarceration. Sochi Cartland is a senior at Brown University studying literary arts and Hispanic studies. Their background is in disability justice, and they are the chapter coordinator of Project Let's at Brown, in addition to working for the national organization. Sochi is also a student coordinator of the Transformative Justice Program at Brown, the first TJ program on a college campus in the country. Their primary interest resides in building grassroots infrastructure for responding to harm and violence that operate outside of institutions. We're delighted to have them here today. Um, they have a lot of experience in this and, and we're really looking forward to them sharing it with us. Um, a bit of housekeeping before I pass the mic uh, virtually. Uh, first, we're going to um, hear the workshop and then we should have some time afterward for discussion. Me and Tara and I will monitor, moderate the Q&A. Feel free to please use the chat um, function to, to share questions with us and we can read them out. Um, we also have live and recorded closed captioning. The directions for activating closed captioning um, are being dropped in the chat. So please take a look there if you'd like to use that. And finally, the session will be recorded um, and to, distributed to those who have registered along with a transcript of um, the presentation. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Stephanie and Sochi. Virtual round of applause for you two. Thank you, Marco. Um, thank you both, I really appreciate it. And I'm just gonna share my screen really fast. All right, uh, here we go. So uh, Sochi and I are so excited to be here. Um, just a couple of notes on our end. Um, we are 
are really uh, strong believers and in practicing access-centered practices and just um, echoing that there are captions here. Um, also, you know, do what you need to do to be present in this space. If you want to be laying in your bed, um, lying on the floor, uh, however you want to show up, doodling, um, headphones on or off, you know, it's okay with us and we want you to be present in this space in the capacity that um, feels best for you. Um, one sec, y'all. Uh, just a couple of um, notes about content warnings and notices. We'll be, we will be talking about um, some of the history of psychiatry, which is not so pretty, um, you know, specifically violence against indigenous folks, black folks, um, and multiply marginalized folks, including um, ableism, racism, medical gaslighting. Um, these topics might be a little bit difficult to hear. Um, we encourage you to uh, take a step back if you need. Um, this will be recorded again, so you can come revisit the material um, when that feels best for you. Um, I also want to acknowledge that, you know, decolonization is a really big term. It means different things to different people, um, moving from a land, land back approach to indigenous folks um, versus, um, you know, approaching things from a lens of decolonization where we are centering indigenous knowledge. Um, so I'm sure uh, we are all coming to this with different understandings um, and, and want to encourage folks to center um, the uh, explanations that indigenous folks um, provide us with. Um, and with that, in this in this workshop, um, our understanding of indigenous um, folks is not limited to um, folks who are indigenous to Turtle Island. We really believe that liberation um, is uh, across borders and boundaries and that we need to be centering things in a global context. So we will be talking about um, experiences um, and examples outside of a US centered practice. Um, I also want to acknowledge the privilege that Sochi and I have to um, to be here with y'all sharing this information um, when so many people have been forcibly disconnected from their cultural and their spiritual practices and traditions. Um, so it really is a privilege for us to have this direct knowledge um, to be able to study um, and learn about practices um, that are both part of our cultures and different from our cultures. Um, and with that, I just want to take a minute to um, acknowledge from my lens um, some healers that I've had um, the ability to work with in Swaziland, which has been um, recently renamed to Iswatini. Um, I was for first a patient and then working alongside um, Gogo Nolanga and in the lineage of uh, Kuzwa Lenezwa and Zini Wamadota. Um, and these are a group of Sangomas in Swaziland. So I'll pass it to Sochi. Hi, um, so Sochi speaking. My image description is I am wearing an olive t-shirt and a yellow big hoop earring. I'm a Latina femme. Um, and you can see the gorgeous Puerto Rican sky behind me. I do want to name that I am in Fajardo, Puerto Rico, which is the original ancestral land and unceded territory of the Taino people. Um, and just really echoing stuff, it is an extraordinary privilege to be able to have access to, to share, to learn um, this information. I also want to name my teachers. I have learned extraordinary amounts of transformative justice and healing work from Dara Bayer, Camila Pelsinger. Um, I also want to name that I am Mexican Indigenous and my father's family came over on the Mayflower. So there, I really feel like the trauma of colonization also really lives inside of my body. Like there, this is not just um, something that exists in the abstract. This is something that affects us all on a really deep and personal level. Um, and we all have to take an active part in decolonization, right? It can't just be a value. It has to be something that we practice. Um, and so with that, I think we're ready to get started. Yes, and thank you, Soch. I also want to give um, my image description. Um, I am a white Puerto Rican Jewish femme-ish presenting person. Um, I have clear glasses on and a gray t-shirt that says uh, disability is an intersection. So we will get started. 
So yeah, that was us. <laughs> um, and just an overview um, and a disclaimer, we have a lot of content here. We're gonna try our best to get through it all. Um, we encourage you to ask questions in the chat as we go. And if it fits with what we're talking about, we'll try to address it. Um, we're gonna go through a bit of the foundations of psychiatry and how it's interconnected with settler colonialism, eugenics, capitalism, and racism. This is a very, um, non-complete history of psychiatry. We're going to kind of cherry pick some important points, um, but there is, you know, so much more here. Um, we also will be talking about um, a decolonized and Indigenous-centered understanding of trauma and madness and be highlighting some of the folks listed on the screen. Um, we'll be talking a bit about carceral logics and how um, the conception of disability and madness and neurodivergence has been inextricably linked um, with the carceral system and the carceral state inside of what we call the United States. Um, and we will hopefully end with some examples of some um, different community healing practices um, and, and a focus on collective liberation, how we are um, thinking about healing and care and support outside of institutions, um, outside of professionalized and medicalized settings. Um, I want to start with a um, something that I learned from Dustin Gibson, who is an incredible organizer um, in the disability justice space, which is starting with uh, centering people. Um, so I think, you know, sometimes we can be talking theory, talking very abstractly, um, and, and forget that this is about real people, as Sochi just men mentioned, real bodies, real minds. Um, so on the left, we have an image of Zachary Bear Heels, who um, is an indigenous man. He was 29 years old um, and he is neurodivergent. Um, he was taken by police after somebody called 911 about his erratic behavior, quote, on a public bus. Um, in 2017, he was murdered in police custody after being shocked over 12 times with a taser and punched 13 times in the head. Zachary was experiencing a mental health crisis and was abused by the Omaha Police Department. An autopsy determined that Bear Heels did not die directly from the shocks or punches, but rather from excited delirium. Um, so I don't know if y'all are familiar with this term excited delirium, but it has absolutely no grounding or basis in um, medicine. It is a term that is used disproportionately to blame um, Black Indigenous people of color who are neurodivergent or mentally ill for their own death, basically meaning they got so worked up and so excited um, that they spontaneously died, um, which serves to remove the locus of responsibility from those who, who murdered him. And we have Soraya Reese on the screen. <clears throat> um, Soraya is a 15-year-old uh, Black biracial girl. Um, she was routinely bullied for being biracial, um, which led to um, various symptoms of mental illness. Um, and a doctor suggested that she'd start taking antidepressants. Um, she, about a year ago, she was um, abruptly taken off her psychiatric meds by a doctor who was not her regular physician, um, which triggered a psychotic episode. Her father found her pouring a small amount of gasoline on the carpet at three o'clock in the morning and promptly called a crisis intervention team to come and support Soraya. However, the crisis intervention team called the police who arrived at Soraya's home threw her on the ground, handcuffed her in front of her family, and arrested her for arson and attempted homicide of her family members. According to Soraya, she had no intention of lighting a fire. Um, she was questioned for hours in a psychotic state, coerced into answering questions and confessing to things which she had no intention of, um, and her family was unable to see her um, for weeks because they were considered to be the victims of the crime. Um, Soraya was sentenced to 11 years in kid prison, uh, where she is currently held and being routinely physically and sexually harassed. Um, I encourage everyone to look up Soraya Reese and to get involved um, in seeking justice for her. So I'm just going to take a moment for folks to process that and, and turn my light on. Um, we also, I know this is a lot of heavy content. Um, we encourage folks to uh, share in the chat what brings you here and why you're here, um, what you're hoping to get out of the workshop um, so we can kind of have some interaction with you. This was supposed to be more of an interactive workshop, but 
we are where we are. So yeah, we'd love to hear um, what brings you here. And as you do that, I also think it's worth mentioning that none of this uh, content that we'll be going over tonight is being handled lightly. Stephanie and I are both disabled. We have both lived experience with psychiatric incarceration. We have both experienced substantial abuse at the hands of the medical industrial complex, and we are both actively committed um, to doing work in a different way, in a way that is harm reductive, that is more empathetic, more rooted in community. Um, and we're excited to share that with y'all. So please just know that we are feeling that pain with you and are really there. Thanks, Soch. So we will get started um, with some foundations of psychiatry. Um, just a first kind of frame here. Um, psychiatry is um, it's colonial legacy, but it's not just legacy. Um, it was part of the colonial assault and it is still ongoing. Um, I think that's important to, to recognize and remember. Um, and, and currently where we're at, psychiatry, um, it does not account for the multitude of injuries from colonization um, and actually further exacerbates colonial trauma through assessments and treatments that occur in um, carceral institutional settings. And we will be talking a bit more about what that looks like. Um, China Mills, in her work on decolonizing global mental health, has talked about colonial psychiatry as a medicalized colonizing of lands, peoples, bodies, and minds. Um, and a quote that she has is, understanding of impairment and distress in the context of the violence of colonization and the conjunct processes of colonization racial, gender, class, and ableist oppression as expressions of empire. Um, I think it's also important to note that while these are linked, they are also dual processes, right? So some um, populations have both experienced colonization and, and what is referred to um, as psychiatric um, psychiatrization. Um, so really the process of analyzing something um, psychiatrically. Um, and as we'll kind of move into, um, there has been this kind of global undertaking to frame an increasing number of experiences globally that are the direct result of oppression and violence in psychiatric terms. And we'll be talking a bit about, about why that happens. Um, so on this slide at the top, um, it says mental illness is inherent in justifying slavery and colonialism. So I think it's important to note um, that this is something that after, um, you know, after um, folks began engaging in these practices and these violent practices, um, they needed some type of justification, right? Um, and, and thinking about um, for indigenous peoples, there was this um, kind of perception um, that indigenous peoples were kind of not corrupted. They were pure, childlike, um, and needed to be protected almost um, so that they, they couldn't be mentally ill. Um, um, and this is sometimes referred to as the, quote, noble savage myth. Um, and conversely, um, Black folks and enslaved Africans who were brought here um, were, were kind of perceived to be already an innately mentally ill, right? Um, born without civilization, um, something that's inherent to them. And for both of these um, both um, peoples, the, the solution was colonization, right? Bringing civilization to black and brown bodies so that they will evolve. So even though the, the thought process behind why colonization was necessary was, was different for both indigenous peoples, for enslaved Africans, um, the, the solution remained the same, that um, colonization, bringing civilization um, will heal, will help um, folks to evolve. Um, I also want to make a note, I think importantly, of um, some of the contrasting values um, that occur within, um, you know, Western cultures and in more indigenous cultures globally. Um, so thinking about, you know, competition, conquest, efficiency, domination, this belief in some objective truth, um, and most importantly, um, individualism, right? Um, so I'm sure many of you have, have heard, um, you know, of an individualist culture. So really thinking about how um, many Western cultures will prioritize an individual over the community. Um, this is an outstanding colonial ideology that um, fuels racial capitalism. Um, and it's also a belief that, you know, depending on others and being interdependent, which um, we all are, um, that's considered shameful. 
and in contrast to indigenous values of um, cooperative uh, cooperation, collectivism, mutual aid, um, a connectedness to nature, um, a prioritization of spirituality and honoring time. Um, and, and we know that most um, global South and indigenous cultures are collectivists. Um, so working together, supporting each other to achieve community well-being, being essential um, and prioritized over individual well-being. All right, thank you so much for that, Steph. Um, so going into the timeline, so this is an, obviously an incomplete timeline of psychiatry, but we're gonna start with pre-1417 Chinese, Indian, Arab, and indigenous communities across the globe, they already had a conception of what mental illness look, was, and it had absolutely nothing to do with the very pathologized, diagnosable concept of mental illness that we see today. It was much more rooted in, oh, there are people who have needs. There are people who are exhibiting non-normative behavior and really coming together as a community to figure out how to best support those folks. Um, and really rooted in culture and spirituality and working as a community. In 1417, the first psychiatric hospital opens in Valencia, Spain. I do want people to be really critical of the fact that that is a nation in Europe that is a predominantly white nation, that, that whiteness and white supremacy have always been linked to psychiatry, um, and we should be really critical of that. And then in 16th century Europe, um, there was the Enlightenment and the Cartesian duality. So the body and mind are not the same thing. There's a separate separation of them. So therefore, the body can be tended to by doctors, right? And then the mind can be tended to by psychiatrists, by therapists, um, but that they are inherently different things. And so that's also how we see this like real divide start happening be between psychiatry and other parts of medicine. Um, I think it's really important to name that because that's why also coercion is so much more rooted in psychiatry than it can perhaps be in other forms of care. Um, Symptoms in original psychiatry were understood as witchcraft, demons, sins. Now it's understood as a brain imbalance, right? So also there's this huge emphasis on individuality. There is something wrong with you, wrong with your neurochemistry. Not that this is a very normal reaction response for most people to trauma, um, that this is something that is honestly a normative behavior um, given living under white supremacy, living under capitalism, um, that these are actually very normal responses to harm at that scale. Um, and then in 1752, Quakers were the first to treat the insane inside of the United States. Um, they were also the first to use solitary confinement. Um, and so we, again, are seeing this incredible link between psychiatry and between the carceral state, between methods of literal torture, methods of imprisonment, lack of re freedom, restriction of movement, everything like that. So again, thank you for those in the chat who mentioned Draftomanian rascality. Um, in 1851, there was a eugenicist, uh, Samuel A. Cartwright, who coined this term, Draftomania, that was considered a mental illness that infected enslaved Africans and caused them to flee. He did not understand why enslaved Africans would want to escape. And so he was like, this must be a mental illness. This must be something that's diagnosable. And it was very much used as a justification, right? As a way to excuse colonialism as a way to excuse and perpetuate enslavement. Um, and so then the next is um, dysastia at the top here, which is um, basically proposed as the cause of laziness among enslaved Africans and in the six census of the United States, um, that, which was the first time that free African Americans were uh, counted in the census they were seen as having 10 times more likely to have mental illness, right? And so the, the theory is that enslavement was the proper place for Black Americans. Enslavement was a natural cause and cure for these mental illnesses that were created to justify that enslavement. So we really need to be interrogating how this was created to uphold white supremacy, to uphold capitalism, to uphold chattel slavery. Yeah, and just quickly, and we'll get um, to an example in a bit, but something that, um, you know, Dustin Gibson talks about is that um, once, you know, uh, 
freed um, enslaved um, Africans were kind of recaptured or brought to a psychiatric institution, what was the treatment? Um, you know, uh, labor, right? <laughs> it was another form of enslavement, of extracting labor under the guise of treatment. Um, and we're going to see that connection continue to happen up until, you know, this moment um, where there, um, you know, are this, this, this conflation of treatment um, and punishment, um, that we're going to kind of continue to see that line being drawn. Yeah, thank you for the addition, Steph. Um, so we also want to talk a little bit about hysteria, which hysteria is a term that comes from Greek. It means uterus. Um, and so for the purpose of this, we're going to be referring to people with uteruses um, as a way to have inclusive language, but also want to honor and acknowledge that um, because of the way that this was really rooted in social perceptions of gender, this mostly affected women and femmes, um, but anyone who had a uterus could be diagnosed with this condition of hysteria, which was a condition of being irrational, overly emotional, against civilization, right? That was a way of policing women, was a way of maintaining heteropatriarchy, um, was a way of just maintaining the ways that um, women are considered like subordinate in our culture. Um, and so then the vibrator was used to treat hysteria, right? So also incredible amounts of sexual violence happened to these women who were forcibly penetrated without their consent um, in the name of a cure, right? And also it's noted that it was created by a male doctor. Um, and so in Latin America, hysteria was used to diagnose people with uteruses who could not cope with being civilized. So again, you are not coping with colonization well enough. You are not adjusting to the forced trauma of assimilation and so therefore we can diagnose that, we can call that hysteria, we can call that an irrational response to what is actually a very normal response to unbelievable trauma and abuse. Yeah, and I also want to mention, you know, there, I think, um, something that we're going to see come up and that, that continues to come up even, you know, in the work that Sochi and I do and just in, in living in the bodies we live in with the experiences that we have, that you know, you might be watching this thinking, oh yeah, this is, you know, this is the past. It's not so bad anymore, right? Um, or, you know, we don't do X, Y, or Z anymore. Um, and, and regardless of whether or not that's true, the reality is that an institution and a practice cannot and should not ever be divorced from its history. It's intrinsic to the practice. Um, and we, we absolutely have to reckon with that. Um, and, and if that manifests in, in, in folks, especially multiply marginalized folks, being fearful of engaging in mental health treatment, that's absolutely valid. Um, and that is one of the ways it manifests. Um, so just, you know, keeping in mind that there are things that we are talking about that have happened in the past, but there are things that are very much still present and that legacy is present. Um, so I just want us to kind of hold that. Um, and as, oh, go ahead, Soch. Oh, I was just going to also say, and taking accountability for harm that happened in the past will never happen unless we honor the legacy that is ongoing. Um, we will not be talking very much about post-protest psychosis. We will not be talking about forced sterilization as much as we want to, right? We just simply don't have the time, but those are all things worth looking into as a way that medicine is still weaponized against black and brown bodies and still being used as a tool of colonization. Um, someone in the chat mentioned black, the black mother fatality rate, which is another great example of that. Um, so continue being really, really critical of thinking, why do I think that this is in the past when this is actually very much ongoing and actively denying it serves no one, um, it will not serve our liberation. Yeah, and I would definitely recommend um, the book Medical um, Apartheid by Harriet Washington um, as a really excellent overview of, of particular um, abusive uh, history towards um, African Americans. Um, so we can kind of see this theme emerging, right? That we have, um, you know, people with uteruses are inherently irrational and emotional. Um, we have black people who are inherently mentally ill, um, criminals, degenerates in their terminology, um, and indigenous folks being, you know, noble and good hearted, but childlike. And that everyone needs Western civilization to be fully human um, is, is the theme that we are, are seeing happen. Um, going back to a little bit more of a timeline and some history, um, we have in 1889, the Great Confinement. Um, so this is where, and this um, 
is predominantly taking place in Europe, um, where any person who is considered to be an other by moral characteristics, visible characteristics, brain injuries, et cetera, um, is institutionalized. Um, and this is to protect uh, civilized society from degenerates. Um, this is really allowing doctors to observe um, mental illness, to um, to study it. Um, and each institution is really creating their own descriptions, their own diagnoses and justifications. Um, yes, just got a request to slow down a bit. Thank you. Um, cool. So we are moving then to um, the early 19th century, where we have Freud, who we just possibly cannot get into Freud right now, um, who is bringing us talk therapy. We have Darwin, um, who is bringing us, um, you know, eugenics in the form of um, looking at genetics and biological idealism. And both of these are, are really shaping psychiatry in a specific way. Um, which is to value some traits more than others. Um, a lot of people do not know um, about um, the ugly laws, which were not fully repealed until 1974. Um, this happened in the United States where it was illegal for um, people who were unsightly or unseemly. Um, this is disproportionately impacting visibly disabled folks. Um, as well as black folks and poor folks, um, it was illegal to be in public. And then this slide has a lot on it. Um, with, sorry, with this, I just wanna highlight how, you know, we have this pattern of psychiatry utilizing pseudosciences and embracing eugenics, um, really serving to function um, to pathologize survivors and pathologize um, any resistance to oppression and violence by white patriarchy. Um, so in 1927, there was the Supreme Court um, ruling on Buck v. Bell, um, the infamous words by Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes of three generations of imbeciles is enough. Um, which um, stated that compulsory sterilization of the quote unfit is constitutional. Um, good to know that this has never been overturned. Um, this is literally still um, law. Um, and we have in um, between 1939 and 1945, um, about 300,000 people, um, predominantly disabled people, were killed in psychiatric hospitals in Germany and Austria um, under Nazi Germany's regime. Um, and this was a specific plan called Action T4. Um, and this was actually um, something that was kind of the, the grounding of the Holocaust. These were test subjects um, in, in mass murder. Um, and it, it started a little bit earlier in the 1920s. Um, they were sterilizing and experimenting on disabled folks in um, German psychiatric institutions. Um, and in 1920, um, psychiatrist Alfred Hotch and the jurist Carl Binding published a treaty um, called Permitting the Destruction of Unworthy Life. Um, and that is really what became the, blue, uh, the blueprint for um, exterminations of disabled folks that were carried out by the Third Reich. Um, kind of skipping around a bit, but just wanting to highlight some parts here. Um, in 1980, um, trans folks were officially classified by the APA as having gender identity disorder. Um, and not until 1980 was hysteria declassified as a diagnosis. Um, so what we can see here is the intermingling of eugenics, of colonialism, of racism, ableism, and this idea of biological idealism, right, that is blossoming into psych um, psychology and was used to justify the oppression of people. Um, I think the other pattern that is really worth noting is that this was all legal. There are many things active in psychiatry today that are legal. That does not mean that they are not harmful and that does not mean that they are not abusive. Um, I would say like involuntary hospitalization is absolutely one of those things. Forced chemical injections, forced restraint, slavery was legal, exactly. And I just really want us to be knowing that I, I understand protocol. I do a lot of crisis response work where I have to work within Rhode Island, which is the state that I predominantly do this work in Rhode Island protocol, I understand the limitations of it. And I also understand that this is an act of genocide that is ongoing. 
and that also needs to be named that just because it is legal does not mean that it is okay. Um, so yes, step next slide. Thank yes. you. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the Central State Lunatic Asylum for the color. Um, so that is next slide. This is the, um, oh, the Hiawatha I'm sorry, Asylum. That's my you're so good. Don't worry. Um, yeah. So this is an image of the Hiawatha Asylum for Insane Indians. That was in Canton, South Dakota. Um, it was the only federally funded um, asylum for indigenous folks um, that was operating between 1899 uh, and 1933. Um, and what we know of it today is that many people were there for reasons that had absolutely nothing to do with mental illness. Um, there were folks with physical impairments um, and um, disabilities. Um, people were there for arguing with uh, reservation agents, um, refusing to give up on ceremonial or spiritual practices, and refusing to allow their children to be sent to uh, boarding schools. Um, so I'm going to read a, this is in a book I highly recommend, uh, Decolonizing Trauma Work by Renee Linklater, which we will uh, be talking about Renee in a little bit. Um, but just a quote from the book from an investigation done on Hiawatha. Um, it says, children were straitjacketed and chained to beds, lying quietly in their own excrement. He found one young epileptic girl chained at the ankle to a hot steam radiator with shackles borrowed from the local sheriff and said that it was a miracle that she had not been severely burned. He found calm, well-behaved, and mentally healthy patients who had been locked in their rooms for periods of up to three years. He found every single window locked and barred. Um, do, do, do. And um, they had hired attendants from local farm families who were responsible for making decisions on the application and use of restraints on patients. Such decisions were not open to revi revision or review by professional staff. Um, so I think that quote really speaks for itself um, and really goes to show, um, again, just one an additional example of, of the violence that indigenous folks have faced and especially the violence of pathologization, right? And I think that that many indigenous folks and scholars have drawn this link between being pathologized and losing freedom. Um, and something that Renee talks about in, in her work is that, you know, rather than indigenous folks using the specific language of anti-psychiatry, um, they were engaging in everyday acts of resistance without necessarily using that terminology. Um, so, for example, families would um, share quote, share the burden of, of a family member who may be experiencing psychiatric distress um, and, and keep them at home in the community and working to, to support them um, without having to utilize um, institutions. Um, so again, sorry for jumping the gun earlier, <laughs> gonna talk about uh, the Central Lunatic Asylum for the Colored Insane, uh, which was a psychiatric facility that was founded in Petersburg, Virginia in 1870, and it was the only mental institution for African Americans until the state integrated in 1970. So this institution, it's important to know, was created after sla slavery had ended in parts of the country, after slavery theoretically had ended. Um, and it was really used as another way to get labor from uh, freed Black folks. Um, Racism absolutely shapes the treatment, the attitudes of the care providers to the patients. Um, there are multiple reports of um, patients who were psychiatrically incarcerated for reasons like refusing to step off of a sidewalk to let a white man pass, talking back to a police officer, talking back to their boss, homelessness that's a direct result right, of having been forcibly enslaved. Um, so we're seeing, again, a lot of the reasons that people are being incarcerated in these psychiatric facilities really similar to the reasons why black and brown bodies are being incarcerated today, right? And um, it's also just worth noting that the case reports that were released, there are um, comments uh, referring to specific uh, patients, such as Georgiana Page being described as the old useless harlot. Over half of the people who were psychiatrically incarcerated here had notes depending on how useful they were and useful in terms of labor. So they were either useful or useless, and that's how they were categorized, and that's how they were treated. There was another patient who was Godfrey Goffney, 
who was noted as saying that he had attempted to kill every white man, they said that he was psychotic um, and that the cause of his psychosis was being free, right? When in reality, none of us, not having the lived experience of having been enslaved, have any right to deem that as non-normative behavior, right? Like if, I think that there's this assumption that happens very often in psychiatry that you are able, you, because you have a certain set of training, you are an expert in the lived experience of other people, right? And only the people who have that lived experience are the experts of their own minds and bodies, are the experts of what is normal behavior for them. Um, I, yeah, I just cannot even begin to say enough how unbelievably just white, rooted in white supremacy like these um, institutions are. There was, um, yeah, so there was repeated references to spatial usefulness or lack thereof, et cetera, et cetera, and they were really just creating a working force. Um, so with that, we're gonna move on to partial logics. Yes, um, I just wanna quickly add, yeah, as, as Sochi mentioned that, you know, some of the other notes of why patients were there, uh, refusing to step off the sidewalk to let a white man pass, talking back to a police officer, um, homelessness, which is a direct result of, you know, being stolen from their ancestral lands. Um, and, and one of the, the patients who um, their story just shocked me the most, um, Caleb Burton, who was self-described as being on a mission to save the world. His note said he was delusional, insane, and it resulted from freedom after the war, which as Sochi mentioned, really is just an indictment of emancipation. So what we're really beginning to see is that the mental health system and prisons and jails have an intersection, which is carceral ableism. Um, they are cut from the same cloth. They are both institutions that really the function is surveillance, is control, is eugenics, is maintaining people in, in restricted environments. Um, under the guise of safety, right? And we, we know that not to not be true. We know that real safety exists in the context of mutually reciprocal relationships and in community, right? Not in these supposed facilities that really just only facilitate harm and abuse. Um, so just some statistics I'd like to share. Um, disabled people are 16 times more likely to be killed by police than non-disabled people. And more than half of the people killed by police are disabled or neurodivergent. It is also incredibly important to say that the vast majority of those people are Black, are Indigenous, are people of color, are trans, are homeless. Um, and over 40% of mentally ill and disabled folks will be incarcerated at some point in their lifetime, which is a horrifying statistic. Um, and also, it's also worth noting that both of these systems function off of capitalism. Disabled people are honestly worth more money to the state in hospitals, in jails, than they are on disability benefits, than they are in the real world using resources, which is really just a way of saying that we have become such an individualized society that we, very few people have access to community, have access to services that are free, and so are relying on a state that that is, of course, what is supposed to be their job when their job is really protecting property, right? And so that both of these forms of incarceration also are working to benefit the state under a capitalist lens. Um, and so it's also important to know that when we talk about when just deinstitutionalization happened, um, which was, I think Steph mentioned a little earlier, which was when asylum started getting shut down, when um, theoretically community-based mental health resources were supposed to be created, like those funds never materialized. And so people who were previously in asylums simply got shuttled to prisons and jails. And we saw a mass increase of um, disabled folks in those institutions. It's also worth saying that the three largest mental health providers in the United States right now are prisons. It is Rikers, Cook County, and LA County Jail. And that is a horrifying statistic. There are three times more disabled and mentally ill folks in prisons and jails than they are in psychiatric hospitals. And they shouldn't even be in psychiatric hospitals in the first place, right? Like that's not the solution either. The solution cannot be based in imprisonment and confinement. Um, yeah, so again, we're seeing this pattern where the legal system criminalizes mental illness, criminalizes neurodivergence, disability, by making disorders, disruptions, non-normative behavior, whether they are perceived or imagined, right? That the cases of excited delirium, that is a perceived mental illness that people 
we're dying as a result of police brutality, right? Like that is an imagined response. But in this world, in this system that has been created, there are people who have power and there are people who are disenfranchised by a state that is using incredible violence. Um, and so whether or not you actually have a disability, you are being um, incarcerated for that real or imagined disability. Um, and so we also need to know the ways that prisons and psychiatric facilities produce mental illness. They produce disability. They are disabling experiences. Being hospitalized was an incredibly disabling experience. I was hospitalized for, uh, for suicidal ideation, and I promise you I was only more suicidal when I was released. These are not places to heal. They are places to monitor. Um, and just thinking about, you know, having to be strip searched not having access to your loved ones, not having access to a cell phone or the outside world, not having access to fresh air, especially in COVID, visitors are not allowed in psychiatric, most psychiatric institutions, right? Um, not having access to my own clothing, having male guards after knowing that I had been sexually assaulted, right? Like monitor me, like these are all ways in which the psychiatric system really just creates more abuse, um, more violence. Yeah, and one example I want to give, um, I was trying to find the tweet. Um, I don't know how many of you saw this. I'm assuming it was deleted because I can't find it anymore. Um, there was a doctor who's always on CNN, Lena, Liana, I'm trying to find it. But anyway, um, she is uh, always like giving medical correspondence with CNN. Um, and after um, um, our president went for his joyride in the um, car with his mask on um, with the Secret Service members in their full PPE. Um, she tweeted that, you know, if Donald Trump was her patient and he had COVID and was trying to leave and go in the car, that she um, would get security and restrain him and put him on a psychiatric hold. And everyone was like, oh my God, yes, like, for sure. Um, so like we can see how there's this criminalization aspect, there's using um, the tools of psychiatry as a weapon of control. Um, and, you know, I'm not in support of our president, but I'm also not in support of weaponizing the tools of, you know, the mental health system. Um, yes, Dr. Liana Wen, thank you. Um, it was her tweet. Um, so yes, that um, example of just how very quickly, um, you know, I think a lot of folks who work in the medical system would prefer not to link um, how it's connected to carcerality. Um, so I just wanted to share that um, as an example. Uh, so, go ahead, Soj. Go. All right, um, so I'm just gonna read a quote. The medical industrial complex creates this idea of healthy and the idea of wellness so that can situate those that are normal and those that are not healthy. Those that, I'm sorry, <laughs> and those that are normal and those that are healthy and those that are not, and then be able to profit off of the difference. So that's a quote from Mia Mingus. Do you want to go over? Oh, you're freezing up for me. Um, oh, there you are. Um, yeah, so this is just a really quick. Um, we are not going to have time to go over this. Um, I encourage you all to look it up. It's um, Mia Mingus, and um, her blog is leavingevidence.wordpress.com. Um, and she has mapped out the medical industrial complex for us, which has so many different competing aspects and parts um, and, and really encouraging us to think about the interconnectedness of profit, power, control, exploitation, et cetera. Um, and I'd encourage anyone who is in the medical profession to become acquainted um, with that. Um, just really quickly, as I mentioned, I think it's it's critical when we're talking about liberation to have a global context always, um, you know, in line with the profit that we've just been talking about, the profit gained from medicalizing distress. Um, you know, we as the United States have found it incredibly profitable to also convince the rest of the world that they experience distress in the same way as that Americans do. Um, and even if, you know, the way that Americans experience it, it's not a monolith, um, but thinking about this biological aspect of it. Um, and there's an entire global mental health movement that as China Mills talks about in this book that I highly recommend, um, you know, is working to deny local realities of distress. 
Um, China also says, you know, the enforcement of and dependence on medication um, and expertise from the global north really works to undermine and erode kinship-based and indigenous systems of support and other ways of knowing and responding to distress. This universal mental illness, everyone, everywhere, um, is different from making the claim that distress um, manifest in red forms is universal. Um, this is because psychiatric frameworks are mediators of that distress. They provide but one way of understanding, yet globally are being framed as the truth. Okay. Um, we're at 650. Sochi, we're so right on our timing. I was so off, but it's great. We're gonna, you know, this will, you're gonna get recording slides. If you have to log off, no worries. Um, we're gonna move through this as best we can. Um, so this is a, a group of folks from uh, Rwanda, and I want to read a quote. Um, it's from a podcast um, that Andrew Solomon is talking about his time um, in Rwanda with some traditional healing methods. Um, and the quote is, it's a quote of Andrew Solomon's of a quote of someone in Rwanda talking with him. So the, the quote I'm reading is from a person um, in Rwanda. He says, we had a lot of trouble with Western mental health workers who came here immediately after the genocide and we had to ask some of them to leave. They came and their practice did not involve being outside in the sun where you begin to feel better. There was no music or drumming to get your blood flowing again. There was no sense that everyone had taken the day off so the entire community could come together to try to lift you up and bring you back to joy. There was no acknowledgement of the depression as something invasive and external that could actually be cast out again. Instead, they would take people one at a time into these little dingy rooms and have them sit around for an hour or so and talk about bad things that had happened to them. We had to ask them to leave. Um, and that's truly one of my favorite quotes and I think a, um, a very unironic way of describing um, the mental health system. So the podcast, I think it's The Moth, and um, the podcast was called The Notes on an Ex Exorcism, which I just sent in the chat. And so we really want to be thinking about in defining mental health as uh, the ability to have justice, which is the term Chantal Figueroa. Um, and just thinking about how, how different that is from like whatever your conception of mental health or mental illness is right now. Mental health is the ability to have justice, the ability to have access to that, um, which is something that unfortunately is denied to so many of us. Yeah, and really quickly, um, the World Health Organization currently defines mental health as a state of well-being in which an individual realizes their own abilities, can cope with the normal stresses of life, can work productively, and is able to make a contribution to his to their community, which is basically like an advertisement for capitalism. It's not good. Um, so, you know, we always encourage folks to, to have a, a personal understanding of what mental health means to you um, and really think critically about that. You think about how the World Health Organization definition has so much to do with disposability, so much to do if you are not able to produce, you no longer have value, and that how that really feeds into handicapitalism and the other things that we've been talking about. Whoever just asked about Fanon, he's coming, don't worry. <laughs> um, Okay, so I think, again, it's important just to frame um, decolonization. Um, and this is a quote from Renee Linklater, the author of Decolonizing Trauma Work. Um, and she says, psychiatry can't be um, decolonized. Its roots are in colonial structures, but we can create space for indigenous healing strategies. Um, so to her, that looks like embracing and centering indigenous knowledge and worldviews and cultural healing strategies um, that indigenous practitioners find useful, um, as well as engaging in a dialogue generally around the usefulness of psychiatry and the usefulness of prescribing DSM-based diagnosis to indigenous people. Um, 
So she talks about how diagnoses are really one marker of a journey, right? And I want to encourage us to really think critically about what it means to be given a diagnosis from an institution whose job it is to uphold the status quo, right? Um, and something we talk about in our work, Sochi and I, is that um, you know, diagnoses are useful. I saw someone in the chat talking about um, how, um, you know, gender um, dysphoria has been reclassified and how it's important um, to have something so that you can get benefits back right from insurance and it can be covered, um, you know, for a um, uh, surgeries or, or, or medications, et cetera, accommodations. Um, so, there, there definitely is an interconnectedness of recognizing, you know, take what's useful from a diagnosis, but recognize its limitations. Um, and, you know, Renee talks a bit about how really when we think about it, PTSD is currently one of the only diagnoses that actually implies that something has happened to you. And that's the reason why your symptoms are occurring. Um, and she talks about an example of residential school syndrome, which was put in the DSM, um, thinking about a PTSD like response to um, to being put in a residential boarding school as an indigenous person. Um, and, and she says, you know, it's, it's really not the person who should be pathologized. It's the process, right? Who is actually sick here? Is it the person who's experiencing residential school syndrome? Um, or is it, um, the person who's perpetuating it. Um, so she says that it should be called the genocidal response. And one of the ways we can approach decolonizing mental health work is by actually calling things what they are and having accurate names. Um, and some of you may be thinking, oh, well, the DSM added some culture bound syndromes. Um, and, and Renee says, no, that's still pathologizing indigenous knowledge and experiences, right? By implying that they're mental illness and they need to be treated medically as opposed to a spiritual sickness that must be handled um, spiritually. So a little bit more on Renee Linklater. Um, and quickly, I just wanna say, just like how there are things about diagnoses that are useful, there are also things about psychiatry that are useful. Like this is not, just like us condemning psychiatry. It is like, I am personally on psychiatric meds. Uh, yeah, a little bit. I think the thing that is really important to name is that psychiatry was never created to care for people. It was created to control people. Similar to the way that prisons were never created for safety and security, they were created to protect property, right? So we need to be critically thinking about what are the roots of the system and how is the system honestly run at its core? Um, which is why we don't talk about reforming psychiatry, which is why we have to talk about harm reduction and what are ways that we can engage in harm reduction, which we'll talk about a little later on. So uh, Renee Linkletter, um, the idea that mental health is achieved by restoring balance both to yourself, your relationship with others, and your environment, right? So it's a very holistic way of saying, why, why are we focusing on the individual, your individual emotions, when really it's about relationships. It's about relationships with other people, relationships to the world. And also acknowledging that trauma is not individual the way that psychiatry really makes it out to be. Trauma is current, it is ancestral, historical, collective, and we will not be able to heal from trauma unless we acknowledge that it moves beyond the individual, right? I'm thinking about like the collective trauma that I, as a Latino person, am experiencing right now with everything that's going on with ICE, right? Like that is a collective trauma that Latinos in the United States are experiencing. Um, and like that is not a trauma that will be individually fixed by psychiatry. Um, and then also the idea of blood memory. So blood memory is the collection of memories we are born with. I think that when psychiatry wants to go into intergenerational trauma, which it rarely does, this is like what they're getting at, but it's not just the trauma. It is also the intergenerational resilience. It is the just intergenerational memory that is guiding us through this life and the next, um, which we have to tend to, right? Um, there's also this idea of parallel realities as, and multiple realities as a way to replace psychosis. Um, I'm thinking of the criteria for diagnosing people with psychosis and how it's most often hallucinations, hearing voices, speaking to people who don't exist, right? And how in many cultures, including in various parts of Latin America, talking to your ancestors is a very important spiritual practice. It is a spiritual practice that in the United States you can be hospitalized for, um, but really just because you are not experiencing a reality that is the potential, potentially the reality that's being experienced by most people does not mean that the reality that you're experiencing isn't a reality and it isn't your reality. Um, and so Mel Madrona, um, that healing requires a dialogue with the illness. The illness also has spirits that is, again, this relationship, this meeting, this conflict, 
um, and that we will not be able to heal unless we address it. Um, and then there's also the idea of ethno stress. Um, so basically the idea that the, the internal stress and harm that people are experiencing are very, it's very much a symptom of um, European colonization is a symptom of the sheer dehumanization, right? And so we cannot be pathologizing it without naming what it is, which is a normal response to harm. Um, and then there's also uh, this idea of the soul wound. So the soul is wounded. So therefore, it will not be healed unless we are able to engage spiritually, unless we are able to discover what the source of that soul wound is. And a lot of that healing, again, happens in very spiritual and community-oriented ways. Um, and so also prioritizing indigenous healing strategies for indigenous people, um, for people of color to confront the damage caused by colonization. So much of the legacy of colonization is saying that certain bodies, certain minds are more valuable, more important, and ultimately just like more worthy of life than other bodies and minds, right? And the indigenous healing strategy is we are all, we are all by relations, right? Like that's one of the core values specifically of the content nation, which is that we are all related, we all have relationships, we are all worthy of life, and we all have a responsibility to one another. That is a vastly different way of thinking about healing than the current American westernized white way of thinking about healing. Um, yeah, I just want to address one of the uh, comments that came in the chat about how a parallel reality approach could be really harmful for someone. Um, and I definitely think that, you know, everything that we're saying is not going to completely apply um, to everyone. Um, you know, I think the, the main point that we're talking about is that um, many people who have different spiritual practices or different understandings um, of their mind and how it works, um, can end up being pathologized because, you know, the definition of psychosis really at its core is believing or seeing or hearing things that other people don't, which is very, very subjective. Um, so something that comes up in our communities a lot, you know, for a current moment example might be um, if um, you have, you know, a black friend who is um, been going to protests and talking to you about how they feel that they might be surveilled by the police or by the government. Um, and they're worried about that. Approaching that through a lens of pathologization that, oh, that's, you know, nothing to worry about. That's a delusion, um, which oftentimes happens to multiply marginalized folks would be incredibly harmful. Um, different people have different experiences with altered states um, where some might have a more friendly encounter with voices that they hear. And some, it might be a terrifying experience that you want addressed um, whether through medicine, through therapy, et cetera. Um, I think our, our kind of um, goal is to broaden the approach and, and, and introduce folks to different kind of conceptions of that, um, but definitely not um, saying that it works for everyone. Um, also, so some folks are having a hard time hearing you. So if you could get a little closer, that would be dope. Um, so really quickly, I also want to go over that you have a medicine wheel. This is made there are very many indigenous folks who um, have ties to the medicine wheel, uh, the people of the Dagara Nation in West Africa, and also many um, people in Turtle Island, what is now known as Continental America, have this idea of a medicine wheel, but basically the four quadrants um, symbolize heart, body, spirit, mind, and the idea that wellness cannot happen until all of these uh, quadrants are in alignment. All of these quadrants are um, being fulfilled, being healed in unity with one another, and we really need to be thinking and criticizing the way that psychiatry really focuses on the mind. It does not even focus on the body. You know, at no point in my conversations with my psychiatrist have they asked me if I'm home secure, if I'm food secure, which are things that at multiple times in my life I haven't been, right? But that is a very critical part of my wellness and my healing. Um, so the idea that those things can't happen until all things are in unity with one another. And really quickly from my own personal lived experience and being in community with other disabled folks, um, you know, when, when the body does come up in relation to uh, mental health or, or a mental health diagnosis, it's typically in my experience been done in a way to dismiss the realities of what's happening with the body. Um, so for me, um, you know, I had a um, spinal infection that was um, routinely dismissed as a psychosomatic um, manifestation of my lived experience with neurodivergence. Um, I was dismissed by many, many neurologists, many different doctors, um, until it, it got to a point where they were able to find it. Um, but I think that that is an important thing to mention that when we do take the body into account, um, it, it, it 
can show up in a way of dismissing somebody's experiences. Um, Fanon, incredible. Um, I We cannot do him justice right now. So it's just really highlighting um, of something very brief of his and, and recommend the book, uh, Black Skin, White Mass. Um, but he introduced a concept of socio-diagnostics. So really indicting colonialism, um, saying that colonialism itself is uh, pathological um, and quote, a disease that distorts human relations and renders everyone within it sick. Um, he also um, gives an example of how during colonization, um, there were um, studies done about the layout of the cerebral structures of the North African um, that were responsible for them being perceived um, as uh, lazy, um, inept, impulsive. Um, that was something that was, quote, biologically organized. Um, so I think this is one of his most useful tools and frameworks of, you know, socio-diagnostic psychiatry that we cannot possibly understand psychological problems or distress outside of the conditions of oppression that may lead to them, um, which is why Sochi and I have talked a lot about how it's really difficult to hear people talking about, you know, COVID um, igniting a mental health crisis. Um, yes and no, right? It, it's not just that all of a sudden um, all of these people are mentally ill. It's very specifically a social and economic and political crisis that has ignited and exacerbated a mental health crisis. Um, but the response looks very different if we're talking about those social factors or if we're just saying, well, you're having a hard time dealing with this, um, so we should treat you individually. Um, and again, it's, it's not black and white, um, but just thinking about terminology how we lay things out and how we think about those things. And one of my favorite quotes by Fanon, um, if it is society that is sick, then it is society that needs to be replaced. Um, quickly, I'm going to go through another um, really dope human, um, Ignacio Martin Barro. Um, he was actually murdered by uh, the CIA in El Salvador, and he was um, very outspoken and, and critical of Western psychology um, and developed a couple of really useful frameworks, one of which being um, critical mental health. Um, so really thinking about how um, we have to be critical about politics, um, social and emotional um, issues that are um, affecting our mental health, right? And he really talks about this ability to discern what symptoms might be a response to oppression and which ones might stem from mental illness um, and inherently linking social justice um, as a form of mental health care. Um, he also talks about these four main critiques of Western um, psychology and psychiatry, one that we tend to focus on biology. Um, the second that, you know, as we mentioned, things tend to be um, individualized and we tend to erase the context of what makes people ill. Um, homeostatic, you know, we should not fear um, chaos or change. Um, you know, he says, he's quoted saying, sometimes we need a revolution to fight oppression. Um, you know, the status quo might just be the thing that's killing us, um, and we, we can't be afraid to do something different. Um, and in terms of a historical, that's another big mistake that we tend to make. Um, you know, if there are um, if 200% more Black Americans are diagnosed with schizophrenia, are they more schizophrenic or is something happening to them um, that we need to look into? Um, and we're seeing that happen, um, you know, that Black men in particular are being diagnosed um, with psychosis and schizophrenia at rates much higher than other populations. Um, you know, we are part of uh, a history and a context. We know with epigenetics research how trauma is passed down. Um, and there you know, there is a political reason why psychology has um, been a historical, right? Um, because to medicalize suffering is to take away those political responsibilities of what that context means to people. Um, and I think we have to be very, very clear about that. Uh, this is one of my favorite graphics um, ever. Um, it is a image of a little Pac-Man talking to a therapist saying, I see dead people. And uh, Martin Barreau talks about this concept as normal abnormality, right? 
describing the context versus the symptoms of an illness. Um, so um, in a, a workshop by Chantelle Figueroa, who studies this, um, she talks about how there were extremely high levels of anxiety and depression during the El Salvadorian War. Um, and talking about, right, how is it a normal reaction to a context of war? And what, again, is actually ill in that context? Um, a, you know, as she says, a normal reaction to abnormal environment of persecution. Um, so I think, again, this goes back to that idea of psychosis, whether it's something that's harmful or something um, that is a, a, an accurate depiction of your context. And that's something that only you um, can determine and decide. Um, and, and again, not going to be applied to everyone, but really wanting to introduce some of these concepts. Um, in addition to mental health being something really relational, um, as we've been mentioning. Um, and lastly, for this section, I just want to highlight um, Dr. Samaj Abir, who is the chair of the mental health unit at the Palestinian Ministry of Health. Um, there's a really great article. The title of this slide is the title of the article. Um, Palestine's head of mental health services says PTSD is a Western concept. Um, so she talks about how in the West we're really measuring um, social psychological pain and saying this is depression. Um, and again, what's sick, the context or the person? Um, she says that in Palestine, we see many people whose symptoms um, are a normal reaction to a pathogenic context. Um, and I think what's even more important from this is she talks about how um, in a US-centered conception of PTSD, um, you know, something we tell folks is that, you know, you're safe now, right? The, the event, the, the trauma that's over with, now you're safe. And I think we really need to think about trauma in a context of what does it mean to face ongoing trauma, right? For Black Americans right now, that's constant trauma. That's ongoing trauma. There is no, um, it's over, now you're safe. And I think a lot of the con um, concepts that we've developed in a U.S.-centered way um, really ignore that reality of ongoing um, trauma. Um, and one of my other favorite quotes um, by Hussein um, Abdullahi Bulhan, uh, psychiatry, like any therapy, should be the meeting of two free people. All right, in our, what time is it? Uh, we're gonna spend just a couple of minutes going over some examples of different um, community healing um, strategies and approaches. Um, a couple of disclaimers um, just off the bat um, is that, you know, I really believe, I know Sochi believes this, that we have the ability to support our healing in community. Um, you know, oftentimes we have lost the ability to do this um, as things have become professionalized and medicalized and monetized. We just outsource everything to the state, um, you know, birth, death, all of these things used to be approached in the community. Um, and I think that it is similar for mental health and, and peer support. And we want to be um, looking to other strategies as well um, that prioritize that. Um, I also want to say that not everyone who's tied to a specific culture um, identifies um, with a specific um, culture is going to engage with those healing strategies, right? You know, there, as we mentioned, there's been a very specific and concerted effort to ensure that people do not have associations to their original healing methods. Um, you know, in the United States, it was illegal until 1978 for indigenous folks to practice traditional ceremonies um, under, it wasn't legalized until the American Indian Religious Freedom Act of 1978. Um, and something that Sochi and I talk a lot about is that, you know, there are no perfect responses, um, that community-based strategies for healing are often more value-driven. Um, so there's more of a likelihood that those values will be met and matched and that healing will occur. Um, but there are still many issues and considerations to think of. Um, you know, there are practices of chaining mentally ill folks globally. Um, in, in certain parts of Southern Africa, um, children's disability might signal a sign of a, a parent, specifically a mother's bad behavior. Julie Livingston talks a lot about this in her work um, in Botswana. Um, and, and a kind of classic praying away a disability or an illness. So there are harms that can occur in community and there are harms that can occur um, in institutions. 
Um, just want to share here a quote from Bessel van der Kolk, who wrote The Body Keeps the Score. Highly recommend that book as well. Um, he says, there is something about communal movement, music, and singing that can restore the inner equilibrium disturbed by trauma. Um, one example that I am familiar with um, on the screen are an image of uh, South African Sangomas, who are traditional healers. Um, and typically are going to be approaching um, psychiatric distress and mental health um, from a community-based framework. Um, there are sangomas who specialize in divination. Um, so what you see on the screen is a sangoma throwing bones. Um, they'll have a bag of bones, um, various bones and shells and items. Um, you'll kind of blow into the bag and the sangoma will roll out the bones. And that's kind of their diagnostic process and their diagnostic um, tools, um, in addition to using various herbs, um, plants, different medicine making, um, and, and different strategies for healing, um, soul retrievals. Um, there are um, processes where if you uh, personally or your family is being cursed um, by some spirit um, where you actually build that spirit a home and you bring wine and money to the spirit and kind of ask them like i recognize you i see you and i built you this home um so thinking a lot again about how renee link ladder talks about that diagnose um um a dialogue with the illness um and one example of, of how that's approached um, in Zimbabwe, um, there are a group of very mighty grandmothers who have banded together um, for um, a, a strategy that they call the friendship bench, which is very simply um, some lay health workers who are trained to deliver talk therapy at a primary care level um, to help um, folks with, you know, more um, what we would maybe call lower level mental health issues in the realm of anxiety and depression. Um, and thinking about, you know, locally they have um, come up with a term that translates into thinking too much. Um, they have also created a Shona specific um, diagnostic guide that um, really applies concepts of their culture and spirituality into figuring out what might be going on with a person. Um, and there are just these benches in different communities where um, these grandmothers will sit and wait for folks to come and speak. Um, and they found it to be extraordinarily beneficial for folks. Um, Steph, sorry, do not want to interrupt. I just want to say I'm really appreciating that everyone is engaging with this material. However, please do notice your use of language um, and not put incredibly traumatizing information about harm that have happened to other people in the chat. Um, yeah, I, I, I really want people to be able to engage in a way that is safe. Um, and there is very much a difference of talking about lived experience versus talking about harm that other people have experienced in really graphic ways. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there. Um, yeah, and I'm just seeing someone mention um, not speaking about, you know, traditional healers who engage in harmful practices. Um, I did mention, um, you know, people who've been chained. There were absolutely, you know, we gave the disclaimer in the beginning of this section that there are um, practices that are harmful in the community and practices that are harmful in institutions. Um, the rate at which those happen tend to be greater in institutions, which is why we're giving that um, disclaimer um, and wanting to highlight some different approaches that folks may not have heard of. But you are absolutely right. It's not like medicine, psychiatry, 100% bad, community solutions, 100% great. It's not that black and white. Um, so I appreciate you bringing that up. Amazing. Um, yeah, I really just want to echo that. Like there have definitely been times that I've been harmed by traditional methods of healing. And I think the main difference for me is like a state was not able to confine me when I was experiencing that harm. Like a state was not able to literally disappear me. Um, that happens to several folks in psychiatric institutions. I was not forcibly injected. Um, there are just like also levels of harm. And I just think that the sheer physical abuse, sexual abuse, forced confinement that happens in psychiatric institutions happens at a very alarming rate. Um, there was a really excellent study by Mad in America um, of folks who detailed their experience in psychiatric institutions and they collected like case studies and also um, like quantitative data. And I just, one of the quotes that sit with me is that 
um, someone saying that they would rather be dead than ever be put in a psychiatric institution again. And that is just unfortunately so much of the experience for all of us. So it's important to be critical of everything. And also it's important to think through, okay, what is the most harm reductive? Like what will cause the least amount of harm? What options are available right now? And what options disproportionately harm folks, especially black and brown folks, especially trans folks, especially disabled folks. Um, Steph, can you put the Mad in America study in the chat while I talk about this? I'm um, sure so I see the screen, so I can't, um, I'll try to get it. Do not worry. Um, so really quickly want to talk about curanderas, um, which are very uh, common in lots of parts of um, Latin America, specifically in the region of Mexico that I'm from. Um, who are like traditional healers who use combinations of different like herbalism. Um, they have been heavily infected by Santeria as well. Um, and really it's just rooted in identifying like what is troubling your spirit, like what is troubling, um, like where is this living in your body and using somatics and using different like ways of reconnecting with the earth um, to really think through, okay, how can we treat this illness in a really integrative way? Um, knowing that it's often not called an illness at all. It's like called a trouble with your spirit, trouble with your body. Awesome. Um, and I just want to highlight two efforts that are happening in the U.S. before we wrap up. Um, one of them is the Anti-Police Terror Project. They have launched an initiative called Mental Health First, um, which is um, they're currently only working remotely, but it is a mobile um, crisis response that um, has peers um, involved, um, nurses, community mental health workers um, who are available for de-escalating crises, um, conflict, conflict resolution, domestic crisis, um, domestic violence, excuse me, um, and they are doing um, really wonderful work um, in prioritizing a non-police response to, um, to mental health crises. Um, and I don't know how many of y'all know about peer respite centers, um, but essentially they are non-medicalized um, houses that are staffed by peers who have lived experience um, where folks can go if they are in psychiatric crisis. Um, they are incredibly valuable resources. There's only about 14 in the entire United States. Um, and a study was done in California that showed folks who checked in to peer respites were 70% less likely uh, to use psychiatric inpatient or emergency services than those who did not stay there. Um, so there are some really valuable work. Project Lutz is also doing this work with our um, peer mental health advocate program um, and um, thinking about um, how we can be uh, centering people who have lived experience in the delivery of care and healing options. Um, and that is all we have for content. Thank you all for bearing with us. I'm really happy to see um, the, dis the discussion in the chat and I'm grateful people are sharing experiences. Um, you know, I, I think Sochi and I both don't want to um, come across as, um, you know, completely saying that one thing or another is the solution. You know, we, it's going to require many, many different solutions, people working together, practitioners working with people who have lived experience, um, you know, medical doctors working with traditional healers um, to, to really get this right and provide the care and support that people need and want um, in moments of crisis, in crisis prevention, in on, um, ongoing support. Um, so y'all will have um, these slides, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Um, yeah, and also adding to that, that the goal is not just to have multiple options, but to really center consent and self-determination in those options, which is something that the current um, psychi psychiatric institutions don't do um, at no point during any of my experiences with the psychiatric incarceration, with psychiatric institutions have I had like any autonomy over like what my treatment looks like, um, what meds I'm on, they, that is something that was done to me, right? So we really want to focus consent, self-determination, like autonomy in every single aspect of this process. Um, and that's the goal. Yes, absolutely. Um, there are a couple of questions um, in the Q&A. Um, if you want to submit a question, um, through the Q&A, please do. Sochi and I will not be able to address everything right now, but we will take some time um, and put together 
um, you know, a Google Doc of responses to the question. So feel free to send them in um, and, and we definitely will get to them. Um, and I will put our emails in the chat if you want to follow up with us directly. And just quickly, I want to jump in and say we're going to put a link to a feedback form in the chat as well. So please, as many people as possible, um, click on the feedback form. Um, we'd really like to hear your input. All right, I'll let you guys get to the question. Um, I'm just going to pick this one that just came in um, that Sochi and I can definitely talk a lot about. Could you tell us why social workers and mental health responders instead of police is not going to be enough? We need to further grapple with policing, the creation of this mode of normal, and how that is white supremacist bullshit generally, building community care, pod mapping, and shit like that. This was really incredible also. Thank you, Anonymous. Um, Soch, do you want to start with that? Yes, this is my favorite question. Um, so why social workers will not be enough is they are mandated reporters. Um, they still work with the carceral state. We need to be thinking about the ways that foster care care, right, foster systems, um, ways in which people are like really implicated um, in like criminality, like very often when there are social workers, there are also police. And if we ask social workers to replace police in this role, they will be taking over the role of policing in terms of surveillance, in terms of control, in terms of monitoring some of the emotional state, right. And I also think we need to be thinking about reform to police systems really legitimizes the carceral state. It is saying this is a legitimate system. It is putting more money, more funds into a system that is inherently not working and is inherently abusive. Um, I think like the really important um, case of George Floyd, right? Like the Minneapolis Police Department was one of the most radically left police departments in the country. They had crisis intervention training. They had had multiple racial bias trainings and this still happened, right? Like we need to be thinking about policing um, and not trying to replace policing with other forms of policing, but deconstructing the system that allows policing to be possible. Um, also, love pod mapping. The Amigas is a queen. If you do not know what that is, would really recommend it. Um, the Bay Area Transformative Justice Collective has just incredible resources for how to really operate in community care outside of institutions. So, would definitely recommend to anyone who's interested. Thanks, Soch. And I also just linked in the chat an article that I wrote um about um this very topic um another question that i can quickly address someone asked about um how to bring these topics up with your universities how to strategize and organize around these issues on campuses um thank you for asking that question that's actually how Project Let's was born slightly. Um, there's a longer history, but the majority of our growth and really how we got to this place was um, when I was a student at Brown, um, faced with the very carceral way that um, higher education handles um, mental health issues on campus. Essentially, you are a liability, right? It's like, you know, you can kill yourself, but not on our campus because then we have to clean up that mess. Um, and there's also an extreme, I'm assuming assuming there's a lot of medical school students here, or folks who've been through medical school, there's an extremely violent system of, there are special terms that I don't know, but like behavioral management. And there's like these like teams of folks who will monitor or force treatment um, and kind of uh, dictate um, what type of care and monitoring you need while you're a medical student if you have a crisis or you have a documented history of mental illness, which is also extremely violent. Um, all of that to say Project Let's has chapters on campuses um, across the US and Canada um, who are doing this work to organize around ableism on campus and disability justice and higher ed. Um, so if you're interested in, in getting involved in that, um, you can reach out to us and, and check out our website on that. Um, also, Soch, I think you'd be good for this question before you have to go. Um, I'm a psychiatry resident working on an inpatient unit with many people involuntarily hospitalized. I agree that involuntary hospitalization is not just or therapeutic, but I have patients who need a level of community care and support, which just doesn't exist right now. Some of these people aren't able to take care of themselves when, the, when they leave independently. Do you have advice for what I can try to do for someone who needs community support when the infrastructure doesn't yet exist? I think that's an incredible question because reality is sometimes we don't have the resources to take care of people the way we need, right? Like I've been 
on suicide watch for people that's gone on for weeks and ultimately is unsustainable. Like we just simply do not have the resources to care for people 24 seven in the ways that we need at this current moment, right? And I think there's like two parts to answering that. Like one is what are the, what is the work that we're doing to really be preventative? It is not enough to just stay in this place of response, right? Like we really need to be thinking about, okay, I'm really noticing that people do not have access to community in a really, in a way that is really harmful. So how are we as psychiatrists going to really engage community at an early level, right? When people come in, are we asking them, what does your informal support network look like? Let's do pod mapping together. Like let's talk through people in your life who you want to come with your with you to your appointments who you want to make a crisis plan with like let's make a crisis plan together and identify who you would be comfortable sharing that with right also acknowledging that the thing on your crisis plan should not be call 911 should not be call the hospital it should be here are the things that you can do to de-escalate me in this moment um i also think oh did y'all freeze can y'all hear me we can hear you Okay, cool. I'm um, sorry. And I think the other thing is like Project Let's, we do how to do crisis response outside of the carceral state. There are incredible disability justice orgs who do this work. Look us up. Like we, we want to be in community with you. Um, like we really, we really need to be creating these systems together. Um, and so look for where they already exist and how we can uplift each other's work. Thanks, so. Oh, wait, sorry. There's a Sorry, there was another part of that question, which is what I can do now. And I think that things are like really advocating for your patients to the degree that you can. Um, to the, and then I also think like really emphasizing de-escalation. Um, so like not using chemical restraints, not using physical restraints when at all possible, like really prioritizing human interaction, really prioritizing humanity, making sure that people are not being abused if they are being abused. Uh, interfering right to stop that abuse like there are there are direct things in the moment that do support people's autonomy self-determination and really thinking through what those things can be within your locus of control um so this was incredible and an amazing kickoff to rip psych thank you both so much thank you for our attendees for such a, a lively discussion and especially for sharing with all of us, we have a sense of who um, is here and who's participating and who the community is here tuned into RebPsych. Um, again, I'm gonna drop the feedback form into the chat. Um, and I just wanna thank both of our presenters for being here tonight, um, for sharing both their knowledge, their experiences, and also their just presence with everybody. Um, and I also want to invite everybody to come to the um, next website event, which is going to be on the 22nd of October at the same time. Um, you can register. Uh, many of you are probably already registered, but pass it on to your friends. Um, and we look forward to seeing folks at um, all the subsequent events as well. And this has been a fantastic and better than expected start uh, to a very strange and new form of website. Thank you all for being here and thank you to um, y'all for helping moderate and organizing and thank you to our captioners um, for helping out with access. We really appreciate it. Yes, shout out to our IT and captioners, um, Kyle, Christy, and Jason. Very much appreciate y'all. Good night, everyone. <laughs>